Hey there. No, it's not Scoobies. I was going to say, hey there, Scoobies. <laughs> <laughs> Great start. All right, let's try that again. <laughs> hey there, Frackers. <laughs> so we've now started with the actual series uh, in earnest of Battlestar Galactica, watching episode one, uh, named 33. So I'm going to start this with um, just an overview, going from Rich and then to Pete. Um, what were your over- overall thoughts and feelings of the episode? It was great. Um, it's uh, it's got the exact same tone and feel as the mini series. Nothing's changed. Obviously, it's picking up straight where we left off. Uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, would you understand what was going on if you hadn't seen the mini series? Probably not as well as you would have done if you had all that background. But mm-hmm. I would um, actually probably argue you're probably slightly confused. Yeah. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Like, it all makes sense, but you'd be like, who's that? Why is that? Yeah, no, yeah. What's this guy doing on this planet? Yeah, you would. I mean, you, you would you would be confused, but I think you'd probably get a sense of who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, something like that. But um, I love the fast pace of the show, and um, it remind, it was kind of reminiscent of 24. Remember that show from yeah, 2002? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it I came can out s- in around the same kind of time frame. It came out in 2002, so I can understand why... That concept would have been instantly appealing to people. Um, and yeah, more intrigue, more questions. Great. Really good start. Excellent. Uh, Pete, from a rewatch perspective, um, how was that rewatching that episode? Was it as you remember it? Did, was, did it. <clears throat> this is the, one of the episodes which I was looking forward to seeing. I forgot that it was episode one. But I, this was uh, this one really always stood out. But um, yeah, I think um, where the kind of the miniseries is a very explosive, very hard hitting. Um, the pace of it is like very quick. Um, this they kind of and and there they're very reactive um, because it's kind of like you know the, the shock of it. Whereas this is very much about the uh, the emotions that they're, the Cylons are now playing. They're playing this emotional war. They, you know, they end. It, it's everybody knows how it feels to be sleep deprived. So when you start looking at the overall, when it, the first thing in the thing where it says 130 hours sleep deprived, I'm sitting there thinking, I've never stayed up five five days. I can't even imagine. Just like and and everything that happens throughout the show, you're sitting there going, is that because of the sleep? Like, and it yeah. really makes you think. It's very cerebral. So I think it's uh, yeah. I, I didn't think about that last time. So, yeah, it's definitely the kind of things that I was picking up on. Which, funnily enough, because you, you asked the question whilst we were watching it, how long can you sustain this? And mm. I've got a little bit of trivia from my quick Google before we started. Um, so, jumping every 33 minutes means they were kept awake for 5.3 days um, after over 130 hours and 237 jumps. Uh, according to Google, after 36 hours, hallucinations might begin. After 48 hours, uh, you can experience depression. After 72 hours, hallucinations can intensify and you can have delusions. And these are two symptoms of psychosis. Okay. So if we think they were at it for five days with barely any sleep. Yeah, I mean, it, you, uh, yeah, obviously the the whole episode is, is playing off that. You can see lots of people arguing with each other that would normally argue, fighting over trivial things, but... Obviously, as, as we went through the episode and Gaius is doing his typical Gaius thing where he's... Oh, Gaius about to have imaginary sex. <laughs> Again. <laughs> with a robot. You know, talking to whoever. No one no one questioned him and said, you know, I think you need to have some sleep or, you, you know, how are you feeling, blah, blah, blah. They just let him carry on with it. And I did find... It, I mean, obviously it was appropriate, but when Madam President went, he's a strange one, she didn't think... <laughs> He's been awake for five days. I just thought that, you know, she might maybe let that slip, but, you know. That's a strange one. I, th- I think Rosalind's always a good judge of character, though. I think she knows how to push people's buttons in the right way. And I think I said during the miniseries, when she clearly picked up on Lee and uh, Admiral Adama's um, tensions, and she then um, she moved into positioning herself in a Apollo that's got a nice ringtone to it. She starts complimenting. She she's kind of like an emotional yeah. reinforcer. So I think that for her to point that out, I mean, we know it, but they don't. And it's sort of um, I think the other thing as well is you say get some sleep, but nobody can get some sleep. It's everybody. Mm. It was like when he he said, "Oh, have you had your ten minutes?" You know, I can't sit. I think, oh, you know, power napping. You know, and yeah. Anyway, it's. Um, it's like the, um, so one of the things that I'm sure you both picked up on was the, the ticking clock. The mm. tick, tick, yeah, yeah. tick, 
tick. Well, 24. That's that's where I was getting well, that from. Oh, okay. That's, so what made that made me think of that is, do you ever find that, say, for example, when you're up at night and you can't sleep and, and you're sort of tossing and turning and stuff like that, do you ever find, like, if there is a clock in the room, that ticking on that clock becomes mm-hmm. even more... So I, yeah. to me, that's it. kind of what I was... Yeah, I was like, they're dialed into that clicking top, clicking top, click, ticking clock because mm, yeah. they are um, so deprived of sleep. Yeah, it's like a sensory redirection where you're not getting anything else, and you kind of all you can do is just zoning in on it. Yeah, you know. And um, another little bit of trivia for you on that was that um, Edward James Ormus, who plays Commander Adama, during the filming of that episode for that week. Got barely any sleep. Um, so that I well, think maybe it's appropriate. Less of a... Maybe it's appropriate. I mean, that, there's um... method acting, and then there's just like commitment. Well, yeah, I was saying maybe it's appropriate that the EXO went. You do look like shit. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love their relationship, though. I, I think it's that it, you you kind of get that we've served together for a very long time. Hey, I I like seeing you without a bit of drink in your hand. <laughs> you know, it's it's just that honest kind of, and I think it's the kind of thing that once you when when you sleep deprived or you're deprived of certain things the the honesty of people kind of shines through a lot more. yeah no, i completely and, yeah i completely agree on and that i i would be a lot more blunt with you if i'd been a bit, a bit of sleep deprived you know so yeah um so I'm, I'm gonna go through some of the questions that i had here which i'll do a round table on so my first question that i had from this episode where six tells guys that she loves him so do we think that's true or not can cylons love or is this just in his head, I, I think that's. I think that's true. I think. I think she has some. She believes there's some connection she's got, or she's looking for some connection with a human. And when she also says, "Do you want children, guys?" What, the guys all time mind fuck palace. I want to have a baby. He says, "You'd be mad." <laughs> I, again, I think that's that's that's. An objective and aspiration that she's got as a as a more um, advanced Cylon, but um, yeah, it's we'll, we'll see how that plays out. I guess. I think that's her kind of mirroring human development, though. It's that uh, the Cylons they they found self awareness, then they come into a higher form of like consciousness, so to speak, or a state of being. Then they discover religion, but they know that their kind of procreation is all about is mechanical not biological and they want to emulate humans mm. and it's it's almost like you you don't know what their true end goal is mm. so at this point it's about self-discovery and you know yeah admittedly it's self-discovery with a nice slice of you know genocide but you know that's besides the point but they yeah that's that's what i think she's trying to do i think she's trying to emulate which she is not mm. and i think that she 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 craves that she wants to be that so um, at the moment, that's what I'm kind of getting. So, with her. are you saying that you think she is saying it because she feels she has to say it, or do you think she's saying it because she generally has evolved to say it? <clears throat> um, it, it could be a, a mixture of two because they're talking about the the concept of religion and th- they're having that conversation on the balcony. And I think the commandment, that, yeah, the commandment as well. And I think that she is trying to. She's trying to push Gaius towards a different way of thinking, mm. but at the same time, she that is opening up doors for her and challenging her own state of being. Therefore, it's sort of maybe the idea of fatherhood will push him in a different direction. Right. So it's there's a lot of boundary pushing for both sides, especially for someone like Gaius, who's very self-centered. Yeah. Well, my secondary point to this was <clears throat> then based on how we felt about that, because then we know that the other Cylon in the in the fleet is Boomer who is mm. in a relationship with Chief Tyrrell. So again, the question becomes, do we think that she is genuinely in love with Chief Tyrrell? Or is it... So I see, yeah, so those those are the two Cylons that we've seen. Um, interestingly, I, I find that Six f- seems to have more compassion towards Gaius, seems to care about him as a human. Boomer is very much objective-driven. I don't see any... I know, the, I know the, in the first part of the miniseries, there's a bit of passion there with uh, Chief, uh, Chief Tyrrell. Tyrrell. Yeah. But um, I feel like she's more objective driven. I, I don't really see anything past her and her mission. Okay. I don't think we've seen enough for that. 
And also, bear in mind that a lot of it's easy to look at what we see between Gaius and Six is in his head. Is that we see it in a mindscape? We're not seeing it in an actual. So, would you make the argument he's in love with himself? Oh yeah, totally. (laughs) Gaius, he he absolutely. I think that's a given, though. I think that's. Do we? So, I'm opening it up. Sorry, to the next question of that thing because we've questioned: Is that something that they put into his brain? Is it a hallucination, or is she a representation? So if she's a representation, is it a representation of him love his love for himself? That's a great question. And I still don't know the answer to that. I, I feel like she's like his moral compass. And she's sort of trying to constantly steer him to the right decision, even though he's constantly talking to her like she's the enemy. It, it could be. There, there is, uh, yeah, it's sort of like, how do you take it? Do you, is it like, so is it, has he... You know, psych- psych- psychologically snapped, or is it allegorical for the fact of the things that he he's challenging himself on, or, or things that yeah. he wants? He might be taking Laura Roslin's message about having babies and going, "I want to have babies. What's going to be my legacy?" Because a man that ego driven, that kind of, you know, you know, yeah, he's egotistical. He he wants to know how he's going to, yeah, you know, he thinks about his how he's going to survive, but how's he going to be continued? You know, what's the legacy of Gaius Baltar going to be? So it's not, he, at the moment, we don't know enough about what he, about what he, what that represents, I feel. And I can't actually remember what it turns into. That's the thing. I, I At this point, I've forgotten so- what has happened <laughs> next, which is great because it's, I get to discover it myself like you are. Um, but I think that he's still in the middle of that. <laughs> so, so here's a question for you off the back of that, because you mentioned about her maybe being his moral compass. Um, she pushed him to push to Rosalind to shoot down well, did the she, Olympic though? character. Did she? I mean, I feel like that's him telling himself to go into defensive mode. Which is my, my question, because we referenced her being the moral compass. She's the moral representation of his compass. Right. He is ultimately making these decisions. As you say, on the surface... It's Gaius, 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 and he's he's making these decisions based on, you know, looking after number one, and you know, again, there was the decision about the um, getting rid of the Olympia because of Doctor uh, Balter, a Balter. Oh, oh, the Doctor Amaret, yeah, Amaret, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then subconscious, him hearing in the background of everyone's got to have babies, and then you know wanting to have a baby. I think there's um, a lot of coincidence in this. As well, based on what you're saying, because it, it fe- these kind of you have like two w- ways of thinking about the story, and they both play into it. So it's he's either protecting himself, or he's subconsciously protecting everyone around him by what he's doing. Yeah, and it's sort of um, and uh, the it's actually when you look in the scene where she's got him around the corner, and they're going to blow up, and he say she's saying all you have to do is repent. And he says, I repent. Yeah. And then it, while he's sitting there saying that, then Laura turns around and says, do it. Adama says, do it. And they do it. So it's like... So there was a question I had to that. Yeah. What was... Where you can t- take that any way of two ways. So I'm going to ask the question. We'll go, we're going to go the opposite way around. You then, mm-hmm. you on this. Yeah. So based on the fact that he, Gaius, got up, went over, slammed, slammed his hand down, was like, we need to get rid of it. We need to get rid of it. And they both agreed. Do we think, or do you think they would have come to that decision naturally had he not pushed it? Or do you think they may have actually gone a different route, no. Pete? No, Laura's too much of a... She, 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 she's very much a... Um, she wants to protect life. She wouldn't do anything to endanger it. Even if the hard call would be to kill a few to survive the whole fleet, I don't think she would have done it. That's a great question. And I disagree. Because <laughs> I, because you do love a bit of Laura, don't you? I mean, I just, I think that... She's a very warm character. I think she's, you know, I think she's somebody who's not in, she's not in a position she wants to be in, for sure. But I admire her character. But, so you're saying that she would have absolutely um, not shot that ship down? I don't think so. Okay. See, I think Commander Adama would have pushed her to. I think when he phoned, okay. made that phone call, he was like, this is happening. And she was just left with some time to to muse it over before it was going to happen. Obviously, um, Gaius just flat out, you know, went into defensive rat mode and went, kill it, kill it, kill it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as you say, his subconscious was just was just kicking in, taking him out of his little sexual dream and saying, right, just get rid of it. And um, I think it would have happened in any, any, any case, two okay. versus one. 
um, I think. Oh, I think it would have definitely happened. I think the difference there was you saying she had the time to think about that mm. particular... I think they would have got to the same place, but yeah. I think it would have taken a lot longer and I think they would have put themselves in an awful lot more danger. She, she oh, would have been a lot more yeah. getting there. Yeah. 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 She, so, she, she's very... Con- she'll consider over time. She doesn't see... She does react, but in, in a micro sense. Yeah. Something so big like that, she would have like fought back and fought back. And agreed, then, yeah, know, no, agreed. But it didn't, that isn't what happened, you know. No. So. But going back to your original question, would Gaius, of, did he affect the situation? Um, no, because I think Adama would have made that call anyway. But um, it is interesting to me if, if Gaius had said, if Adama had said no, and um, uh, Laura had said no, would Gaius have managed to persuade both of them? Oh, I don't know. Um, they still consider him to be an important character at this stage. Uh, maybe. I, I don't think Adama would would have would had listen to him. No, because okay. he's all about. Yeah, he thinks about the fleet as a whole. Right. Okay. And you know, I think it's it. There's um. Yeah, I don't think he would have ever been in that position. Mm. I think he would have all. He would have made the hard call to make to save the many in that instance. You yeah. look at what happened in episode one. You know, same with Saul Tai. They killed the hundred to save the whole ship when they vented the fires. You know, yeah. they, they made that decision. He said, I would have made that same call. Yeah, good point. You know. So the the next question, off the back of that question, is as once they've sort of, they're at that point of making the decision when the Olympic carrier is not responding and they're prepping and getting ready, um, Six, bringing up religion again, says that it's not Laura's decision when Gaius is saying she needs to make a decision, she needs to make a decision. She says, it's your decision. Do you repent? Do you repent? So the question becomes, do we believe in a higher power going on here? Or do we believe it's coincidence <laughs> think that he said repent and then she said do it? I think, again, it's his conscience just telling him, like, you know, you are in control. You're not in control. Like, it's, it's, it's yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I don't... Uh, that's a tough one to answer, really. I think it's... Because, because you, I, I believe in the coincidence of the story. I think that it's masterfully written in the way that they have like running themes that you know coincide and and you you can ping pong between the two quite mm. effortlessly almost um, like you can like in real life with religion and stuff where people have belief in various other things you can you know, always ping you, pong between being cynical and believing in those things and see coincidence as yeah. coincidence or as yeah, a higher I mean, power do, do you remember, like in in scrubs you had the uh, you had two you had Laverne and Perry very opposing characters and uh, yeah, they talk about the Lord working in mysterious ways, and um, a kid comes in who's been injured, and uh, he, he's like not in a nice way. And Perry's like, "Oh, what do you think about that?" And then later in the episode, it turns out that the kid was discovered with, I think, a brain tumor, and he tried to basically shit on her about that. And um, yeah, it's just the fact that yeah, it, but it was coincidental. You know, I don't believe that that would be a higher power thing. I'm not a religious person. Where's Levan? But it was. in this, they yeah. could. And I think the repentance thing might be just about him as an individual. You know, she's attacking him as a his character, and for him to say, "Yeah, I, I've made mistakes here," because he's still in denial about his. He 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 kind of partly accepts that he helped contribute the, to the human race's downfall. Yeah, but he's also in still in survival mode. He's still. Ray. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Ray. when he said like, I repent, I was like, oh, you're just basically, you know, yeah. cowering in the corner like a rat. But the thing is, though, with religion, it's such a, a fluid um, kind of gap filler. Where, yeah, yeah. Where you kind yeah. of meet, you know, coincidence and all the other things that surround it. Yeah, you, know, you can have like a Venn diagram of all the thing that religion falls into. And it, it is very good from a plot perspective because it can ask the questions that where logic and fact don't always see eye to eye. So it's sort of in this, this is why it makes Battlestar such a, a good show. So uh, moving on to sort of last couple of questions yeah. on this point. Um, we're getting to the act now where Lee has to shoot down the, the Olympic carrier. And <clears throat> obviously we saw the argument between him and Starbuck going on. So my question to you first, Rich, and then to you, Pete, do you think he did, do you think him, between them making the decision and then him shooting it down, do you think they did the right thing? 100%. Yeah, hundred straight up. Hundred percent. I can't see beyond episode one. They did what I thought they wouldn't do, which is, which was to give me access into the carrier through a window, and the characters acknowledged that as well. So I've been to, I've been shown there's no one in there. As I said to you when we were watching it, I was like, how they how's this communication gone across? And they're supposedly talking to someone human. 
and then the ships you know um on a on a set uh trajectory straight towards uh Battlestar they can't get it to to move even when they shoot across the bow and you're looking into the window so it looks like it's a an empty vessel or or um a vessel planted with a nuke or whatever so mm. It looked like a trap. It, to me, it looked like a trap set up by the Cylons, and I was, I was on board with him taking it down. Yeah, Pete. <clears throat> yeah, I think yeah, definitely it was the right decision. I think always in hindsight, and I think the fact at the end of the episode where they're like they're not being pursued anymore. So that was oh, that was number one. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to point out was when he tells Starbuck, Starbuck to shoot across the bow mm, she's mm. kind of grinning she's playful and she's like having fun but the moment that it comes to making that really hard she's decision on it, she? you, yeah. you see how she goes from play to trepidation and Lee is just he, yeah, he's he's almost goes into this you know iron like state where he's just iron mind like state where he's just focused on the fact that though he's on the facts of it it's like if this keeps getting if this gets into the fleet and detonates they're dead you see that there's no kind of moral um well you, you he goes with the, the thing of they're all dead so i'm gonna yeah. ask my next question and move yeah. it back to you and back that way because yeah. this actually follows on um you kind of getting there anyway so mm. this is the right way let's go so in the miniseries when uh admiral what's that more sorry commander Adama. Um, commands Lee to bring the fleet back to the into the zone because they're going to war. He disobeys him and he follows Roslyn. And he's we saw him as that man of the people. He's become a man of the people there. Here, he actually, when given the choice to be more, I suppose, human regarding the people, he went the military route and obeyed the order. So why do you think we saw that change from that second part of the miniseries to now. I, I just think he's rekindled his relationship with his dad. I think he's, I think he's on board. I think he's, um, I think he's stepping up. So you think that it directly relates to his relationship with his father? Yeah, yeah I think, I think he's, I think he's stepping up to be, you know, to be uh, Captain Apollo. I think he's, I think before he was a bit lost. Now he's a bit more, you know, uh, uh, not just on board, but just a bit more confident with maybe who he is, what his role is, and and. More so, just appeasing his dad. I think that's okay. I think that's the key thing there. One other thing I was going to say, sorry, before we get into this, was um, you were talking about that vessel, you know, travelling in to the Galactica and stuff. I also thought that the Cylons were were setting that trap because they were sleep deprived and hoping that they would just like you know get confused, you know, yep. that sort of stuff, and let it go, which. Um, I thought it was like, oh, okay, interesting. They're trying to get them at their weakest, you know. Yeah. But um, but that was that was. That, no, I, t- I totally agree with that because yeah. I wrote here, Cylons waging an emotional war. I think the yeah. the, the, the Cylons are, you know, they're using the fact that they don't think about that. And I think even when they're having the banter over the patrol, and they were they were like, oh, you know, Sharon, you're 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 a Cylon. Or yeah, something. right, right. You know, and they're calling out the fact that she is. They know that she's not. Oh no, they think she's not. But the 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 thing is, though, throughout all of this, you are seeing the Cylons pushing emotional buttons. They are testing the the morality. I think mm. in places they are seeing what the human race will do in given situations. Right. So that yeah. bring, that actually brings me on to so a couple of my my thoughts on what we saw. Um, um, I agreed with you, by the way, Rich. I'd even written down could be a relationship with his father being. Um, patched mm. up and therefore that's why yeah. and I agree with you on that point Pete I, what I'd written down here was outside of the drama element of constantly being under attack Gaius, Gaius references having limits there are many references to tests in theology and religion around how we get tested and what tests our faith and being that the Cylons are so religious uh, their attempts to wipe out humanity in this way could also be considered from their deep faith as being a way of testing the faith of the fleet and so what we're seeing is the representation of their faith being tested as yeah. well as them emotionally, psychologically. Yeah, I think there's it. some some really good themes, I think, throughout the episode as well. Like the, I think you're seeing themes of survivor's guilt as well. Um, yep. And I think that is, that is definitely, um, I think they're playing on like the more immediate emotions that we're going through at the start of this new human race because that's what it is now. It's no longer the colonies. It's, and um, what's the final number on that, Pete? How did we lose 300? Hey, okay. is that math even right? Thanks, Crisis. I can't be bothered to work it out. Should be 48,653. 
That's not what he wrote. God is watching out for I you. I want to go back and look at that. Yep. I can't work out where they're getting their math from. Okay. Yeah, I'm yeah, doing it. the math. Getting my calculator out. I am. Not, I'm not buying that. <laughs> what the fact that how did they get to forty-seven thousand nine hundred ninety-three when only uh, one thousand three hundred and forty-five died? Were they even with three hundred difference? They should have ended up with forty-eight thousand six hundred fifty-three. So some people can't do math, and I'm going on Google right after. Well, no, I'm right. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of figures that I'd already <laughs> taken off. Okay. Um, I haven't done the maths, but this is figures that I, I took from IMDb. Um, so I'm based in on that. So, so it has to be right. Uh, somebody put down that there was 50,298 survivors listed at 6 minutes 30 in. Yep. Uh, then, as you saw on the board, they put 49,998. That was the 300. That's the 300. Dude. And then they listed it as uh, 47,972. Mm-hmm. Um, the only get around from the, the maps outside of the figures we've been given was that when asked about um, figures, Billy had said, like, you know, this, that, these other things we might not even have. And one of the things he said was a correct number. So it, I think their get-out clause is that they said, here's our figure, but we don't even know if it's correct. Thank you, Carol Vorderman. If I could have a <laughs> consonant, please, that'd be great. <laughs> um, no problem. But yeah, I think it's sort of like, there are a couple of, the, even like small points, it's like you were talking in the last uh, cast around, um, you see the characters and you, you find out who they are. Like at the beginning, you see the deers from Sagittarium. And it's sort of, um, and now I'm going to look up what Sagittarius is, so I can look at her and go, does she then fit into that? You know, I haven't but, seen her with a bow and arrow yet, but you never yet. know. You See never what know. advanced military show up, and and also I think the other things that were really touching was the shrine to the missing and the dead um, mm. in the corridors, and I think yes. that just kind of that really kind of hits. It, I think that was like a really big emotional nail. I have I two points on that, actually, funnily enough. Okay. Not just because of that, but also, did you notice when the pilots were leaving to go out to the thing, they all kept touching a picture? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I did wonder. Yeah. So, again, I looked I looked that up to find out what that was all about. So, there's a deleted scene that we haven't seen that relates to that, which I thought was wonderful. There's a deleted scene of um, President Ro- Rosling being given that picture, and it's a picture of the previous president oh, upon seeing right. like, the, the destruction of his, yeah. his planet and that um, as it's being destroyed. And then it's given to them, so that's them touching the president's right, okay. thing as they go out to okay. that, which I thought was okay. good. And the other part, which I really liked, is when they go go through the corridor and you get to the part where D is saying, what's going on? What's my planet? Here's a picture. We can't send picture stuff yet. And I thought this was very reminiscent of like the World War One, World War Two era of people having no idea. Yeah, and, po- yeah postal service. Yeah. 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 And, like and things just being disarray and... And, and you're also dealing with people who are very emotionally heightened because of what's been going on. Yeah. So it's kind of, it almost puts you into like this such a severe state of anxiety that it now lets them, they could potentially bring it down. I don't know what the next episode is. So it's it's a really good, I think it just kind of shows them what they could be at a, in a very heightened situation. Mm. And, it's a, and, and it's sort of like as they develop into how do they, like you said, they can't do it yet. So... And you know that the Galactica is being decommissioned. So it's kind of like, how are they getting it back up to being in a state? So what could it become? You know, what could they potentially then do? Yeah. You know. See, so, when I saw that shrine, I just instantly thought 9-11. I just thought of the um, the memorial around 9-11. And that would have been, you know, that was what, 2021. Uh, sorry, 20, 2001. And this show came out when? Uh, 2003, 2004. That still would have been very raw to people. That's still yeah. That sort of connection you know mm. that's very good true loss. i didn't think about that that's mm. good um the last thing that i've got for this section and, and questioning around things that happened in the episode um helo on the planet did you think you were going to see helo again rich uh i didn't since we've had no real since um, you saw him walk off we've, we've, the... we have no we've had no scenes set or, or storyline leading back to caprica so um when I did see him, I was like, okay, good. I was like, where are the Ewoks? That was my next question. <laughs> um, but then we got to see a bit more. We got to see Silence running, doing stuff. Two of them got killed. See their exercise routine. See exercise good, yeah. routine. I, I did find it fascinating, though, that Six, or the second version of Six, was managed, managing to stay dry in the rain. That was incredible. Her hair looked fantastic. <laughs> um, I thought you were going to make reference to the fact she was kissing another guy. And then, no, well, obviously, that <laughs> then did happen. So... She's the sexual model of the... Uh, well, I think it's just the way she says hello. 
Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, you're a friend. <laughs> yeah, you're a friend. Uh, <laughs> it's just like, bam. Uh, and same question for you, Pete. Did you remember that Hilo... Um, oh, yeah. Continues? yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, and, yeah, I think, yeah, he's one of my one of my favourite characters. But one thing that, I, that I've that i literally just thought of when I was think, looking back to that, because you see Halo on his own, what happened to all the people that he was with? Yeah, I know, <laughs> and, yeah. And, and that makes you think that... <laughs> That, he loves a cannibal. It, well, no, it's sort of like the Cylons have gone after him, and he's had to watch all of those people die. And, and, he's, and then now and he's, he's going to be feeling it, of, of the fight and flight, and the fact that he manages to take out two Cylon uh, agents on his own. But it's the fact that he's he he was with those people. Now they might have just gone off and left him. You know, they might have been like, "Fuck you, you didn't let me on the ship." Or no. he's ran and he's watched them all die because they don't have the training he does. Um, You've obviously been thinking about this for a long time. No, no, but he just just came into my head. And... Um, final question for you, Rich, not for you, Pete, because obviously you and me have seen it. And we know so yeah. what happens. So when you saw that bit at the end, where and then I suppose Caprica Boomer uh, comes along, Caprica and save, Boomer, yeah, and, and saves him from uh, six, and then walks off, and then you see the other six. So what do you think they're doing? What do you think the plan is? <clears throat> Here's what I thought initially. I thought it's just typical, isn't it? <laughs> bloke gets with a hot woman and his girlfriend turns up right at that moment and you're like come on can't a guy catch a break but is it is, is no it, but we know it's not his girlfriend because we know that boomer is with i don't see i mean just tip, in a typical fashion not specifically him but just in that classic uh, situation. have you seen what Hilo looks like he's tall he's handsome that is two women fighting over him it, well exactly <laughs> exactly you just can't catch a break and, she's probably, just, and like she said she's just a friend he's probably she's just, just like friend. back off and let a player play yeah you know? <laughs> she's her in the back um uh, yeah exactly so yeah we learn you can I, I think i don't know but i believe that that six is dead now the 12 because she was shot in the back although they can be rebuilt can't they well um well, no she saw another six straight away so let's let's clarify this point for you because i don't think the show's done a good enough job of explaining it at the moment so when they say there's 12 models there are thousands of each model so that six there's like hundreds and hundreds of her right um so there's thousands of that model and each model so where you saw there's a boomer on galactica and there's a boomer down there that's because there's hundreds of them too so there's 12 different human-looking Cylons in terms of the model that oh, they look thousands, like, yeah, but right. thousands of each one, thousands of copies. Right, okay. So that's kind okay. of why you see that, like you saw with Six, she didn't, bang, she's dead, and the other one's like, okay. So there is yeah. no killing the original then, or killing the, I guess we've got to find well, out, right? No, find you, out. Not, not, not that I remember, but the, I, I think, the there's, only, for me, in my, in my, the gamer part of me goes, so when you kill one, how long does it take to go up to wherever it has to go for the others to then get that information? That's the only thing I, I my my only like dorky question about mm. it. Or do and they have was... different information? So for example, the boomer yeah. on Cap, uh, the boomer on Capricorn, and the boomer on um, Galactica, do they have a shared experience, or are they living completely separate? I'm, I'm wondering that at the moment. And yeah, so that's a to question. Your, to your question, what is her strategy? Well. Episode one, I don't know if the Boomer up uh, on Battlestar versus the Boomer on Caprica are doing the same stuff on the same mission. Yeah. I guess we'll find out. Because as they grow and develop, their, um, their, their kind of their moralities and their, their kind of decision making will differ. Mm. And I think that even might answer your question where you said, do you think she's aware that she's a Cylon? No, I don't. Because ultimately the other ones do. And I think that they are in a state of, you know, they will survive in any way that they have to. But I don't genuinely believe that they know that they're. A no, I, I agree like with you that. on that. So, yeah. Um, and and you know, we've got another four seasons to kind of see this one develop out. So, yeah. at, the, um, at this stage, I think the boomer on Caprica is genuinely, because she thinks she's human, trying to help uh, Hilo. Okay, so you think that she's a sleeper agent? She thinks she's the real boomer. Equally, same on Galact- the Galactica boomer. We think that she's a sleeper agent, or do we no, think she's a... No, I think she knows right, she's... Okay. I think she's... So we think that Galactica Boomer, she knows she's a Cylon, she's there sort of doing cylon things, but the one on Capca genuinely believes she's the real Boomer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I Excellent. don't... I think, I think Boomer on Galactica isn't aware. We haven't had enough screen time with her. All she's been doing is just running. Uh, running missions like you, you, but the, the only reason why we're so focused on it is because the of team the of, carrier huh? 
Yeah. Uh, the, the, so carry yeah, on. There, there's a thing around. The, yeah, yeah. Her interaction with the carrier. Yeah. Um, she's managed to keep you know mentally kind of more copious during uh, you know the sleep deprivation, and you know that. In, I, I I don't think she I don't think she is aware. I think we've just not seen enough for her to do that because her human connection is Tyrrell. You know, and she's been. I can't remember the name of the uh, the new. Uh, person that she's with, played by Sam Witterer. Can't remember actually, the character's to, name. Actually, but. to be fair, you do you have just changed my mind with what you just said because when she's squabbling with Crash Tyrrell, down. Crash Down, that's it. Yeah, Crash Down. When she's when she's squabbling with with Tyrrell, she is very emotionally driven. Yeah, and that is definitely not a side on. You know, that's, yeah, that's like, a highly evolved. Like you know, when he mentioned he, like Hilo's gone, she. I didn't ask you about. Yeah, that yeah, either. that's yeah. yeah. So to be fair, okay, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. okay, so. um Moving on from that, before I get into the final parts, is there anything else that I've reviewed, thought about, anything you've got written down, Pete, that we haven't discussed yet? Yeah, this is the first episode where uh, Commander Adama is referred to the old man. As the uh, old man, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of like the, the affectionate term. Uh, I think there was the, I remember um, when, <laughs> on Facebook um, a very long time ago where I, I think it was towards the end of season, uh, you know, uh, whichever season it was. And I turned around. I went. I wish the old. I wish old man Adama was my dad or something like that. <laughs> Which, looking back on it, I go. That's probably a really bad thing to ask for because that insults my own, my own dad and um, <laughs> the fact that he is an absolute hard ass. But um, yeah, yep. it's. Uh, I, I love that that affectionate term for him. Um, and I think yeah, that that's probably the only other thing I wanted to call out. Cool. Um, last part for me that I wanted to call out. Just um, something I really liked in terms of the way they made the episode look and feel authentic was did everyone notice how pretty much none of the blokes had shaved and it looked like they hadn't shaved for a I week. did notice that on and Captain five, Adama and I, I don't know why I picked shadow. up on that but yeah I just I, I, I if you go back through all of them yeah, yeah. yeah sort of stubble and, and, and I think the other thing uh, with Adama when him and Saul were in the they were eating in the room and he cut himself shaving yeah. oh that's so, why I picked up on it yeah, yeah. Um, I was just like that is a great little touch because I you know, put that down as uh, foreshadowing for the overall um, theme of the episode him cutting himself with the razor is like the fact that they're all on a razor's edge yeah. at the moment in terms of yeah. where, where they yeah. were at in the episode. Yes, very good. Very it's good. true. Oh. Any, any last thoughts from you, Rich? Yeah, I'm, I mean, obviously it finished with... I, I, I think I made a... I did make a joke about this. That pen's getting a lot of action. <laughs> During the episode where I kept on saying, that pen is getting more of a workout than anyone <laughs> yeah. else, with all the numbers changing. And um, I said, it just keeps going down. And then right at the end, it went up by one because they had a baby yes so there is hope yeah but I also pointed out that Laura was clearly sleep deprived when he said oh you know there was a boy born on whichever ship she went a baby and I'm, <laughs> oh, yeah, and I'm yeah. they're going of course it's a baby what else is well, it yeah, I mean, well just, God, <laughs> a fracking right. goat <laughs> yeah exactly oh, she it's not a Cylon to toaster it's uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right um, this brings me to the next section which is something that we started in the previous episode which is the death note. So um, previously, when I asked you, who did you think was going to survive this? Who do you think may not survive, uh, let's say, till the end of the season um, or the end of the show? You mentioned Commander Adama. You think his days are numbered. And obviously, we know that Rosalind has cancer, but you mentioned that her days are, her days are numbered. Is there anybody else, Rich, that you think they're not going to survive? Uh, well... Boomer, I'm, I'm not including because I mean she's a Cylon. She's going to keep coming back. Um, who, and six that goes as well. I think. Uh, I, oh, I'm torn between Billy and Tyrrell. Um, I, yeah, I'm torn between. I think I. So on the moment, you think they've got potential on the death note? Yeah, pot- yeah, pot- I'm mean, potentially both. Um, I just think they they play these these parts where they're not key to the story, but they're key to the they're like really key support to the main characters. Yeah, and I feel like they will they will change the like the decision making of a of a main character if they if they go. Yep. Um, so yeah, they're, they're on the high watch list. High watch list. Excellent. Uh, a new section for us this time, based on all the stuff we talked about last time, as has been mentioned uh, previously and again today many a times, we think that Gaius is a rat. <laughs> um, so we've created the, the rat scale, the ratometer. It will be uh, at the bottom. People will be able to see it on screen. Um, 
So, considering number one is saintly behaviour, and number ten is um, absolute rat, from one to ten, where do we think Gaius currently sits after the, the events of this episode? In in the previous episode, well, the mini series, sorry, yeah. he was. I mean, he started off as a ten. He was definitely a nine at the end of it. Um, with so you I, gave I, him. Did you give him a point for help? Let the lady on. Yeah, that's what I mean. Well, yeah. With with fragments of humanity in there, but with the with the mm. uh, de- with the decision to kill off the ship, which ultimately saved them, but. He was doing it in his own best interest. He's still at is he nine back, back at a ten or is he? No, at no nine? he's still he's nine. He's holding nine. It at a nine because holding it at a nine because in the miniseries he helped them find the device, the silent device, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He but did. Um, so I'm I'm keeping it at nine. He's because he's so he's so strongly persuaded. Um, sorry, so easily persuaded to look after himself, and there's and there's very little that's that's pushing him to do anything right at the moment. So. Um, yeah, especially when he slammed his hand down and he's like, we have to kill that shit. Oh, he's a nine. He's a nine. <laughs> okay. Um, excellent. And do you agree with that, Pete? Um, yeah, I think you... Uh, I, I would actually put his actions around the six and the seven. I think that... Because, again, it's so easy for us to take a moral high ground when you look at the, the facts of what has gone on. You can you can sit Gaius in either side of that, that coin and it doesn't matter. You go, I feel like you're going to be right. Because, yeah, I'd say he's probably a six. Same. Also, I um, yeah, I know that I was joking about keeping count of the amount of times they said frack. They said it twice in this episode. Oh, so we, we have a frack counter of two for the <laughs> pilot episode. Um, based on you saying six or seven, you say nine. I'm going to split the difference and say officially he is currently at an eight. Excellent. Um, and finally, the last thing um, that we're going to do at the end of every single episode: um, Cylon detector. So, who, at the end of this episode, do you think you have any kind of more indication of who may be a Cylon? Or do you feel like you didn't get anything else that might have given you any clues? No difference for me. I think, you know, we, we've seen the current models of, of Cylon at the end of the miniseries. The big big surprise there was Boomer. Um, I do... I mean, I, 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 this can't be right, but I mean, I... You know... Um, Starbucks shows all the qualities of Cylon being so good, um, but I, I yeah, I, 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 I mean, she's the hero, isn't she? So I, I don't know. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna muse on that idea. Our, our current I'm Cylon count is four out of twelve, right? We, we're four. four. 12. Yeah, we've got um, so we've got Doral, Leo Bin, six, and Boomer. Oh yeah, so, four so out we 12. might need a separate Cylon chart just to find out as we get them. But the yeah, as you say, we've got six left. I mean, Starbuck is no, a turbo. No, we've got eight left. Uh, eight left, sorry. sorry. Yeah. So, Starbuck is um, is a Terminator in that cockpit, but, I mean, we'll see. We'll see. Excellent. Um, so, that's everything we've got. These are all the sections. Any other final thoughts before we end? Nope. Bring on the next one. Bring on the next one. So <laughs> say we all. So say we all. <laughs> so say we all. <laughs>